Father, we do give you praise, and we give you honor, and we give you glory, for this is the day that you have made, and we rejoice, and we are glad in it. Thank you. Thank you for spirit of faith. Thank you for this place. Thank you, Father, for Pastors Jay and Debbie, for everyone here today. Lord, thank you most of all for the anointing of the Holy Spirit that destroys the yoke of bondage. Thank you, Father, for an unction, for an anointing to preach. Thank you, Father, for confirming your word with miracles and signs and wonders. Thank you, Father, for the Holy Spirit. Thank you that you loved us so much that you gave your Son a ransom for sin. Thank you that we are free today, free in him in whom we live and move and have our being. Thank you, Father. I receive a fresh touch of the Spirit now upon my life. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Give a shout of praise to the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Well, God bless you. You may be seated. Pastor Jay, Pastor Debbie, thank you so much for this invitation to come. I have not been to Iowa in 26 years. I was about three at the time. been a long time since I've been in Iowa. And to be here in beautiful Cedar Rapids and to come across that river last night and see Quaker. <laughs> Look in my hotel room across uh, this morning and to see all that and to see you this morning and to be with my friends, Pastor Jay and Debbie, whom I got to know through Pastor Nancy about two years ago. And uh, Debbie, you were there with, with Lindsay when she was there in her conference. Lindsay's coming back in October. Back in October. And uh, praise God. Thank God. Thank God. Thank God for an opportunity to be here. And uh, Pastor told me this morning, just be myself. Yeah. Yeah. Well, watch out. Because <laughs> uh, I, I have a plan, but I tell you, the Holy Spirit has the plan. Yeah. And he can just move any direction He wants. So I am pliable, okay? I am pliable. I, I want him to move. And so I praise God. I want to give you, give you special love and greetings from my family. Lindsay is back home. And we had a day yesterday. We, uh, my, uh, I got to the Dallas airport and the, I checked my bag. And the, uh, the lady at the desk said, the flight's right on time. Went right to the gate. And the lady said, they've just canceled your flight. So I went from right on time to no flight. And uh, they said, the next flight's not for another six hours. So, and then Lindsay called and said, the power in our house went out. We had a huge electrical storm yesterday. So uh, I decided I wouldn't go back home. Uh, <laughs> we live on the sixth floor of a, of a high rise and uh, there'd be no way to get up there, you know. So I, I but, but you know what? I did better than Paul. Paul had to stop on an island <laughs> and was snake bitten, you know. So I didn't have to go through that, but, uh, but I did get to spend six wonderful hours in the Dallas-Fort Worth airport, you know. It was so great. And, uh, uh, and then was, got here very late last night, but I'm so glad. I got some sleep, and I am ready to go in Jesus' name. <laughs> Praise God. Uh, say hello to you on behalf of Lindsay and our, our family, our children. Uh, we have three beautiful daughters, uh, Jordan, uh, Olivia, and Chloe. You met Chloe. Chloe's our baby. She's the one we call Royal Roberts in a dress. <laughs> and uh, she helps me with my research. All three of our goddaughters work with me in the ministry. The middle girl, Olivia, is in charge of all our, of our social media. When you see us online or you see us, uh, you see us on Facebook or on, uh, what are those called, those other things that I don't know how to operate? Uh, Twitter. And uh, one of these days I'm going to figure out what Twitter is. <laughs> and Instagram, we're getting big on Instagram now. And uh, I'm learning how to say when people take my photograph, tag me, tag me. I don't know what that means. <laughs> I didn't grow up with any of that stuff. We didn't have any of it, you know. We're lucky we had a phone and a cord that went on, you know. And uh, 
Jordan, of course, is, uh, is the executive producer of all of our television work and sings on our program, so, so it's a family affair. And I thank God for that. I thank God for my family. Um, I'm to preach this morning, tonight, tomorrow morning, tomorrow night, the next day morning, the next night, the next morning, the next night. I think I'm going to preach till Jesus comes. <laughs> So uh, I'm ready and uh, ready to go and to give you my very best. I, I was um, getting up out of bed one morning several years ago. I get up early in the morning for prayer time, and I, you know how you, you, you roll out of bed and you sit there for a minute and try to clear your head so you can get out of bed. You know? And I'm, I'm, I'm doing this, and I'm shaking myself, you know, trying not to wake Lindsay up because you know, I'm going in for my special time of prayer. Clear as a bell, the Lord spoke to me said, your crusade days are over. Oh, well, I was awake. <laughs> and I said, what? He said, your crusade days are at an end. I said, what do you mean? Your crusade days are over. That's what I had done for almost 40 years, all over the world. With my father, I've been in 55 countries. I've preached in every state in the United States, every province in Canada, all over Central America, all over South America, Europe, Asia. Africa, especially Africa. Africa has been like a second home to me. I've preached all over uh, the, the nation. I've laid hands on 34 heads of state all over the world. My crusade days are over? What do you mean? You know, as an evangelist, God has gifted me in, in the operation of the words of knowledge and, and to see great miracles and to have great crowds, crowds up to 200,000 people in one service. And I see as many as 25,000 Muslims giving their hearts to the Lord in one service. What do you mean my crusade days are over, you know? You know, I, I was, at that time I was, I, was 60, see, I was 67 when that happened. And that was three years ago. You do the math. And <laughs> I sat there on the edge of the bed and I said, well, Lord, wh what do you want me to do? If my crusade days are over, what, what do I do? Do I just do television and that's it? Or what, what do I do? To just continue preaching across America? What do you want me to do? I have to have something to look forward to. A man has to have something to look forward to, 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 to do. The Lord said, do you remember what your father prophesied over you before he died? Well, I thought back and I said, yes, Lord, I remember. Just a few weeks before my father died, he laid his hands on me and said, son, when you get into your mid to late 60s, you will become a minister to ministers. And your crusade days will come to an end. And you will begin to teach on three subjects particularly. Healing, Holy Spirit, and seed faith. And you'll travel to the nations of the earth and you'll go to those underdeveloped nations where pastors don't have anyone speaking into their lives. Rural pastors where there's no internet. Well, I'd forgotten that. The Lord reminded me, and I said, Lord, is that what you want? He said, well, as a sign to you that this is me, you'll no longer receive invitations from presidents and prime ministers and kings and queens, but instead you'll begin to hear from pastors around the world. Well, that was three years ago. And um, I, during those years, all those years, I received three to five invitations from presidents of nations that's the, that's the front door going into the country, going through, going through the government, which is what I have done all these years. And the Lord said, that'll stop, and it stopped. But I began to start getting invitations from pastors groups all over the earth to come into their areas where they have no teaching, they have, they've had no training, and they have virtually no access to Internet because they're in villages, they're in the deserts, they're in the, the jungles, and they're not in the major cities. And so that's what's been happening in my life. And we developed a tablet which has 20,000 pages of resources from our ministry, hundreds of hours of audio and video. And my father had also prophesied over me before he died that I would begin a school online. And uh, I started that as a healing school uh, back, uh, I guess I started that school back in 2000, 2009 after my father passed. 2010 
and we now have uh, 50,000 students in that school and in more than 120 countries. So I was well on my way to developing what he wanted me, what the Lord wanted me to do. And so that's, so that's what I've been doing. I've been, been in Africa uh, with this uh, program. I've been up at the, to the North Pole with this program. I've been in, in India. I'm going back to India in a few months uh, where, where I'm teaching and ministering to pastors, primarily pastors who have no internet, no, no, no communication like that. They don't have cars. Of course, they don't have roads. They have bicycles. And they, they are desperate for training and teaching. Many of them have given their hearts to the Lord in a crusade, and they don't know what to do, but they know they have a call to do it. And they need someone to come in to teach them. And so that's what I've been doing uh, since, since uh, uh, for those last three years. And um, I thank God for that. And I, I have the privilege now of traveling some in the United States, not as much as I used to, not as much as my wife says that I travel. <laughs> I fear no man, but I'm scared to death of one woman, I can tell you that. <laughs> so I get to minister in places like this, and... Um, I've changed over the past couple of years, and, and uh, some of the pastors have had a tr profound influence upon me. And they, they told me that when you go someplace and just have one service, all you really can do is encourage the people. If you want to have an impact, you've got to stay for a while. And so that's what I'm doing here. I want to have an impact for God upon your life and the lives of others that you know that you will no doubt bring through this week. And so that's what I'm going to do this week. We're going to deal with healing. We're going to deal with the Holy Spirit. We're going to deal with the principles of sowing and reaping. We're going to deal with the gifts of the Spirit. We're going to deal with putting on the armor of God. If ever there was a time we needed the armor of God, it's now. I just got a text message at 6 o'clock this morning that the, the Daystar, I'm sure you know of Daystar Television, their studio in Jerusalem was burned to the ground this morning. Arsonists destroyed it this morning. Uh, there, there is, uh, there's hell on every corner out there. And there are those who stand against everything that we believe in, and everything that our country was built upon. And if ever there was a time to put on the whole armor of God, it's now. And I'm going to share along those lines, and uh, we'll just see what the Lord wants to do, all right? So I, I want to take I want to I want to apologize to you in advance for what God's going to do to you. Okay? So when it's all over, you won't blame me. Uh, if we have a breakout of the joy of the Lord, it's Pastor Jay's fault. He brought it up. So uh, is it okay if I'm just myself? I, I hope you're not in a hurry. My father, we used to accuse him of not preaching by the clock, but by preaching by the calendar. He would preach those long messages, hour and a half, two hours. He'd just wear my rear end out. I couldn't wait for him to get to the healing line. But I grew up in that atmosphere. And I thought, seeing as how I've not been in this church and I've not been in Iowa in in a long time. I thought that I would just give you a little history today and share some things with you to let you know uh, where I've come from because it is said that you'll never know where you're going until you know where you've been. You must never forget your roots. You don't have to stay where you were, but you must not forget where you were and where you came from. I want you to picture in your mind the year 1918. It was January. It was cold in southeast Oklahoma, snow on the ground. A mother who was pregnant with her fifth and final child was climbing through a barbed wire fence on her way to pray for a neighbor's child who was sick unto death. And as she pulled the wire apart to step through, she said to the Lord, if you will heal this child that I'm going to pray for, then I will dedicate this child that I'm carrying to you. I want him to preach the gospel. I want him to pray for the sick. 
I want him to have black hair and blue eyes. <laughs> brown hair and brown eyes were prominent in the family. She went on through the fence and prayed for the little child, and the child was healed and lived for 86 years. And several weeks later, at the end of January, she gave birth to her fifth and final child, and they named him Granville Oral Roberts. That was my dad. They said, we'll call him Oral, which means spoken word. But it was ironic because he stuttered and he could hardly talk. When he tried to talk, he would stutter, especially when he was under pressure. At school, the children mocked him and laughed at him, trying to get him to talk, because when he talked, he stuttered, and when he stuttered, they laughed. The teacher would send him to get a drink of water, but it wasn't a drink of water that he needed. He needed a healing. And his mother would sit him on her lap and say, son, someday, God will heal your stuttering tongue, and you'll take the gospel of Jesus around the world. And he would say, how could it be, Mama? I can't even say my name. She said, someday. Those were depression days, the 1920s, the early 1930s in Oklahoma. And uh, it was tough. It was tough in depression days in those in the country. And. Uh, he became disillusioned and sick and tired of Christianity and seeing uh, how people were treated as Christians. That somehow if, uh, if uh, God would keep you humble, the people would keep you poor. And they had nothing. And he wanted out. He didn't want to preach. He wanted to be a lawyer. He wanted to be governor of the state of Oklahoma. But he couldn't talk. At the age of 15, he became so disillusioned that he ran away from home, down to a little town just north of the Texas border, a little town called Durant, where he lived in a judge's home and studied law books, delivering newspapers at 4 o'clock in the morning, going to high school, and being a captain of the basketball team, being 6 feet 2, which was tall in those days. And uh, there he lived for several years, and at 17, in a district championship basketball game as he was making a driving layup with the ball. He collapsed to the floor, hemorrhaging blood from his mouth. The coaches came and picked him up and carried him back to his home nearly 100 miles to the north. Three doctors diagnosed him with tuberculosis. In 1935, tuberculosis was the scourge of the Native American Indian people. And there's Choctaw and Cherokee blood in the Roberts family. They put him to bed where he stayed for five months. He lost the power to walk. He went from 200 pounds down to 135 pounds, skin and bones, dying with tuberculosis. His parents having to repaper the walls several times because when he coughed, it spit blood across the room. The only medicines they had were raw egg beaten up in milk. No antibiotics. Well, raw eggs and milk were okay in a, for a cake, but not so much for tuberculosis. In those days, when you had tuberculosis, you died. And the papers had been signed to send him to the tuberculosis sanitarium, which at that time was over in Tallahassee, in the hills of eastern Oklahoma. And when you went there, you came out in a body bag. And he said, to his father, I have gone the last mile of the way. Several other family members years earlier had died with tuberculosis. They knew it was over. People would come to pray. Pastors would come to the home to pray. Some would give an offering. Some would pray a prayer. And one pastor came and prayed a prayer like this. Lord, if it be your will, heal this boy and my grandmother ran him out of the house. <laughs> my grandmother was about five feet tall and five feet wide. <laughs> she lived until I was 24. She was Pentecostal. She was a lay preacher and an evangelist. 
My grandfather was six feet two, big man, big hands, tall man, big voice, huge hands. I remember him well. He lived till I was 19. And uh, he was Methodist. He established 12 churches in Oklahoma and Arkansas. They farmed and pastored. He was Methodist. She was Pentecostal. They were Methecostals. <laughs> he preached and she prayed for the sick. And she said, if you can't pray a healing prayer for my boy, go on home. My grandfather sat at the foot of my dad's bed and said, I'm not going to allow my baby boy to die and go to hell. I'm going to sit here and pray until you give your heart to Christ. It's coming down to the end. And one day as my grandfather was praying, my father, who would later tell me that his face disappeared and the face of Jesus appeared in its place. And for the first time in his life, he began to cry out, Jesus, save me. And he repented of his sins and gave his heart to the Lord as he lay in the bed. The next day, his older sister, my oldest aunt, Jewel, who's in heaven now, came into the room and said seven words that changed his life. Oral, God is going to heal you. Is he Jewel? He said, yes. And the next day, his oldest brother, Elmer, who was 14 years older, came into the room and said, Oral, you've got to get dressed and go into town. There's a man by the name of George Muncie who's preaching and praying for the sick. He has a tent. There are about a thousand people a night coming. People are getting saved and healed. And last night, an Indian boy was healed of tuberculosis. I'm going to take you to him. My dad couldn't walk. He couldn't get out of bed. So they dressed him and wrapped him in a mattress and put him in the back seat of a borrowed car and put in 15 cents for gasoline and drove the 10 miles. And as they were driving, the Lord spoke to him and said, Son, I am going to heal you tonight. And you're to take my healing power to your generation. I can feel it now. <laughs> when he got to the service that night, place was full and they had to sit in the back. And Brother George Muncie preached a message titled, If You Need Healing, Do These Things. And he listed out several points. And then he came to a point where he said, who needs prayer for healing? And people began to come to the platform. And my dad was the last one prayed for, nearly 11 o'clock at night. But when Brother Muncie prayed, he did not say, Lord, if it be your will, heal this boy. He prayed a different kind of prayer. He said something to this effect, you foul, tormenting tuberculosis. I adjure you by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Come out of this boy. Loose him and set him free. And my dad would later testify that the power of God began to come up his legs came up into his torso and up into his body and up into his chest. Suddenly he could breathe all the way in and all the way out without coughing, without spitting up blood. And Brother Muncie put a microphone in front of him and he talked for 10 minutes before he realized he had not stuttered once. It's good to go back and remember. Never forget where you came from because you'll never know where you're going until you know where you've been. He quickly gave up the dream of becoming a lawyer because he knew God was calling him to preach. He accepted that call. He joined his father's ministry and they began traveling, preaching throughout the area. Soon he met a young school teacher by the name of Evelyn and a year later they were married had two children, my older sister, Rebecca, and my older brother, Ronnie, and they moved to North Carolina, where they pastored, then to Georgia, where they pastored, and then back to Oklahoma. Now, it was in the 1940s now, and in 1947, he was ministering and pastoring in a little small town in western Oklahoma, a town called Enid, a very small town, the city limit signs were back to back. That's how small it was. 
They went to the library, but somebody already checked out the book. <laughs> Small. Little 70 member Pentecostal Holiness Church. And they were believing God for one person to get saved a year. Not much was happening. Here he had experienced this great healing in his life, but it, it just wasn't working. And he became sick and tired of being sick and tired. Disillusioned. And uh, he wanted to get out of the ministry because this isn't what he signed up for. He was in his little office there, and I say little office, I mean little office, not much bigger than about like this. And he was studying for his message the next morning when the phone rang, and it was a member who had, uh, had been working in his automobile repair shop, and a, a motor, which he'd had on blocks, had fallen and had landed on his foot, had crushed it and had broken every bone in his foot. The man was just screaming and writhing in pain. And my dad rushed over to pray for him, as a pastor would do. And when he got there, he just brushed his hand across the man's foot and said, Lord, heal, heal him in Jesus' name. And to his surprise, God healed him. And the man stopped his crying and wailing and stomped his foot and said, Brother Roberts, what did you do? Look at this. My foot was crushed. I, I, couldn't, I couldn't move, couldn't put any weight on it. Look, look. He began to jump around. My dad said, well, I, I didn't do anything. I just brushed my hand across. You saw me. He went back home and said to Evelyn, my mother, what had happened. And she said, Oral, this is the beginning of the healing ministry that has prophe been prophesied over you since you were born. Yeah. He said, a, a foot? <laughs> yes. And he said to her, well, honey, if this is God, then I'm going on a fast. I don't want you to cook for me until I tell you. I've got to have a word from God. I've got to know what he wants me to do. And uh, for days, he wouldn't eat. He stayed in the room and read Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and the book of Acts until Jesus came rising up out of the pages. And God spoke to him and said, I'm going to show you people the way I see them. I'm going to let you hear their cry. Let you hear people the way I hear them. And said to him, from this hour, you'll have my power, which will flow through your right hand to bring healing to sickness and disease. And he jumped up and said, Evelyn, you can cook for me. I've had a word from God. And God gave him an idea. I'm not recommending anybody to do this, what he did, but this is the way Lord, the Lord led him. He announced to his church the following Sunday, I've uh, laid three fleeces before the Lord. And if the Lord does not answer the three fleeces in exactly the way that I have laid them out, then I'm resigning as your pastor. I'm resigning as a Christian. I'm going to get a job in the men's clothing store here in town. And I'm not going to serve God any longer. People wanted to know what the three fleeces were. <laughs> he said, in three weeks from now, we're going to have a healing service in the Enid Municipal Auditorium which seated a thousand people. He said, the first fleece is the building has to be full. Well, this is a 70 member church in a little town with just a couple of thousand people. They weren't on television. They weren't on the radio. There was no internet, nothing like that. No way to advertise. So it was impossible to have a crowd of a thousand people. The second fleece was the offering had to cover the expenses. That was even more difficult. And the third was that someone had to be healed so that he knew it and they knew it. And uh, the people in the congregation bowed their heads because they knew in three weeks they would no longer have a pastor. <laughs> but he was very serious. But three weeks passed. They spread the word throughout the little town as quickly and as easily as they could. And the day of the meeting came, 3 o'clock in the afternoon, they drove their little car up behind the building to the stage entrance, and the janitor was waiting for them at the door. He said, are you Oral Roberts? Yes. Well, I understand you are believing for a 1,000 people to be in the building. Yes, that's right. Well, would you like to know how many are in there? I have just counted them. My dad said, I just wanted to hit him. You know. <laughs> 
Roberts. And Brother Roberts, there are more than 1,000 people in the building. He walked to the platform and said, before I do anything, we're going to raise the offering. And we're going to count it before I preach. And he raised the offering. And a few minutes later, they handed him a little slip of paper. And the offering was $3 more than the expenses. <laughs> Second, please. And he preached a message titled, If You Need Healing, Do These Things. <laughs> and afterwards, he said, Who needs the prayer of faith? And people began to line up as he prayed for them. And there was a woman. I've heard this story so many times since I was a child. There was a woman who was elderly, who was German, spoke with a heavy German accent, and she'd had a frozen hand. Everybody in town knew her, and she could not open or close her hand, and had not been able to for 30 years. And when he touched her, her hand just shot open so she could open and close it, and she let out a German scream that could have been heard for miles. <laughs> and people began to rush the platform to see what God had done. People began to line up, and he began to pray for others, and people began to get healed, 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 until suddenly he felt the tug on his coat. And he looked, and there were seven men standing in a line, seven husbands of women who were members of the church, but the men never came. But they had come that day out of curiosity. And they tugged on his coat and said, Brother Roberts, all of us want to get saved. Would you lead us in a sinner's prayer? They had been believing God for one person a year to get saved. Now I hear seven men, grown men, businessmen, all wanted to give their hearts to the Lord because of what they'd seen. And he prayed for people till nearly 11 o'clock that night. Many, many miracles. He was in a state of shock. And the Lord spoke to him and said, Oral Roberts, you cannot stay in Enid. Enid is too small. I have plans for you. And you're going to have to move. You'll have to move 70 miles to the east to Tulsa. Tulsa has an airport. Enid does not. I'm going to send you all over the world. At that time, Tulsa was, was considered the oil capital of the world. And there were great flight connections all over the world because of all the oil-related businesses that were in Tulsa. And so the next year, in 1947, uh, they moved to Tulsa. And in 1948, they established our ministry. And my mother became pregnant with me. And uh, my dad was in Dallas conducting a crusade. I was due on the 8th of November. And my mother, a very unusual woman in many ways, but she had my older sister, Rebecca, on the exact day that the doctor said she would. And she had my older brother, Ronnie, on the exact day that the doctor said she would. And so they, they already knew in the spirit God had revealed to them that I was to be a boy. It was long before the days of ultrasound. And uh, they had already named me Richard, which means lion-hearted. And uh, he was in Dallas conducting a crusade and uh, was scheduled to close on the, on the, um, the night of the, uh, of the, I beg your pardon, I was due on the 9th, that's right. No, no, he was preaching on the 8th, I was due on the 9th of November. And he was due to close the crusade on the 8th and drive home for my birth the next day. The pastors came to him and said, Brother Roberts, if you would extend the crusade three days, there would be a lot more miracles, a lot more salvations. And he said, I'm, I'm so sorry I have to go home tonight after the service because my wife's giving birth to our third child tomorrow. And I have to be there present for the birth. And they said, well, couldn't you call your wife and ask her to postpone the baby? <laughs> three days. He said, well, I suppose I could. So he called my mother and said, Evelyn, the pastors say that if we'll postpone Richard's birth until the 12th, and if I stay three more nights, there'll be many more salvations and miracles. And she said, Oral, if you will set your faith with me, according to Matthew 18, verses 18 and 19, which says, if two shall agree on earth as concerning anything that they shall ask it shall be done by my father in heaven and they prayed and agreed and they decided to postpone my birth from the 9th to the 12th <laughs> now when I tell the story people think I'm kidding but I'm not I'm showing you a demonstration of faith 
She said, you preach tonight, the 8th, and you preach on the 9th, 10th, and 11th. Drive home after the service on the 11th. You get home at 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning and get some sleep, and I'll have breakfast ready the next morning. I'll have my bag packed. We'll eat, and we'll go to the hospital and have a baby. <laughs> so he preached the 8th, the 9th, the 10th, the 11th, drove home, got home 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning, got a few hours sleep. Next morning, she had breakfast on the table, had a little white suitcase packed, after breakfast, they drove to the hospital. And the nurse examined my mother and said, Mrs. Roberts, you can just go home. There's not going to be any baby today. And she said, oh, yes, there is. <laughs> and the nurse said, oh, no. Oh, yes. Oh, no. Oh, yes. Be no baby. Yes. You don't understand. We made a covenant with God. Our baby will be a boy. His name will be Richard. He'll be born today. She said, well, I'm not going to call the doctor. You know, you can sit here all you want. And they sat in the waiting room just waiting. That's what you do in waiting rooms, you know. <laughs> and the hours passed. Along about evening, she thought to herself, maybe I better examine Mrs. Roberts one more time. And they took her in the back room, and a few minutes later, there was a blood-curdling scream. <laughs> Somebody call the doctor! <laughs> And on November 12th, 1948, I came into this world. It's good to remember. Now, I grew up in that atmosphere of my, my de, of, of uh, yeah, 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 I'll do that. Somebody's got pain in your uh, left leg right around, right below your knee, whoever you are. If you just stand up right now, start moving it, you're going to find the pain leaving your leg right now. You start moving it, start doing well, whatever it is you could not do, you're going to find pain leaving your left leg below your knee right now. In Jesus' name. It'll be gone, and you won't have it any longer. In Jesus' name. You receive that? You receive that? Praise God. Give praise to the Lord. Where was I? I was somewhere. <laughs> I grew up in that atmosphere. And um, I was in the tent. Actually, I was under the tent, under the platform in 1950. I was two. I don't remember it, but I was there when a tornado uh, destroyed the tent in, in uh, Amarillo, Texas. Uh, my father had just paid uh, for a, a 7,000 seat tent. And just a few weeks later, in, in Amarillo, it was destroyed completely by a tornado. Of course, those were the days before there were any warnings, like you have today. You didn't have the radar and everything you have today. And the tornado just came out of the, you know, came out of the out of the west. And next thing you know, the tent was gone. I, I don't remember it, but I was there. I was under the tent, and uh, uh, he was able to get a bigger tent, a, big, a better tent, and that's the tent that I grew up in, one that seated twelve thousand. It was the same size. In fact, it was larger than the Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey circus tent, which at that time was the largest tent in the world. That's the tent that I grew up in, all over the earth, in crusades with him. And I loved him. I loved his ministry. I loved to sit on the front row and wait for him to call me up so I could stand next to him when he prayed for the sick. I couldn't wait for him to finish preaching because that meant I got to get up and go up there and be, be with him. And I, I love that atmosphere. I can smell the sawdust now, you know. I grew up in, in those tents seeing great miracles, seeing blind eyes healed and deaf ears opened up and seeing cancers literally fall off of people's bodies. See, you see great miracles and experience the kind of criticism that you talked about earlier. I mean, all hell came against him for what he did, what he believed. They called him everything, you know, uh, they called him a charlatan, they called him a crook, they called him everything that you described up here. You are talking about that preacher asking Peter for his boat. You know, I went through all that. And I went through all the experience of what I went through in school uh, when I was mocked because of whose son I was. And, and, I, and, and they would they'd call my father a crook to my face. And it just, it just destroyed me, destroyed me on the inside as I grew up. And uh, I, I, I didn't hate my dad. You were right about that. But uh, uh, um, I had some strong feelings about the people who were just doing, saying what they were saying, you know. I never cursed them, but wherever I spit, the grass died. <laughs> you know, sometimes in life there's just something needs to be said. Uh, but it drove me inside myself and drove me away from God because I said, well, if that's Christianity, 
because most of those people who were criticizing him were calling him, were, were, were saying they were Christians. And uh, I remember in 1963, I believe it was, 62 or 63, Life magazine, which was the number one magazine in the world at that time, uh, did an expose on my father. Six pages. And Marilyn Monroe was on the front cover, and my father was inside, and they made her out as, a, as an angel. And they painted my father as a devil. And when I got to school, everybody had a copy, including the teacher. And it just drove me inside myself. I, I couldn't take it. It was too hard. I loved my father, but I, I did not want this kind of scrutiny. I did not want this kind of pressure. And as I grew up, uh, I, I, I invested myself in learning how to play the guitar and learning. I, was, I, I could sing by the, by the time I was a little child. My dad stood me up on a chair in Baltimore in, when I was five years old. I sang in front of 10,000 people. And I, so I started singing all over the world with him. And uh, I learned how to play the guitar, and by the, time I was, uh, by the time I was 16, I was the lead singer in a rock and roll band, and I was traveling throughout Oklahoma and that part of the country, making money. And uh, uh, Pastor Debbie and I were talking about the time she lived in Kansas City because I, was, I worked at Kansas City Starlight Theater uh, for a summer uh, while I was in college and uh, uh, had a contract offered to me in the Sahara Hotel in Las Vegas, and uh, I was not interested in God and I was not interested in my father's ministry. I loved him, but I did not want anything to do with that. I wanted to make my own mark. I wanted to be a nightclub entertainer, and I had a contract in my hand uh, to go to Las Vegas and sing in the lounges of the Sahara Hotel, and I was going to make something of my life and come home, and I was going to jam it down their throat. And a funny thing happened to me on the way to Las Vegas. <laughs> I got sick. I was hospitalized at the University of Kansas Medical Center where I was a student at the time. I had gone away from home. I had said to my dad, Dad, get the hell out of my life. And he said, well, son, that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to get the hell <laughs> out of your life. I, I thank God today there were, there were not drugs available in the Midwest in the, in the mid-60s or I'd have been on them because I was involved in everything else. Thank God there were no drugs. There was everything else, though. And um, I lay there in a hospital ward, young men facing surgery the next morning. Now, I'd had a few colds in my life and maybe a flu, and I'd had the chicken pox, but other than that, I'd never had a sick day in my life. Now I'm facing major surgery. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm 18 years old and uh, a college freshman, and I'm on my way to Las Vegas, and I'm sick now, and it looks like it's going to wreck everything. And I lay there in that hospital bed, and I began to call on the one I was running from. It's amazing who you call on when you get in trouble. A man said to me, I don't believe in miracles. I said, well, you will when you need one. I needed one. And I made a deal with God. I said, God, if you'll heal me and cancel this surgery, I'll serve you. Well, that was a dangerous deal. But that night, the power of God went through my body in that hospital room. And the next morning, the doctors re-examined me and confirmed it. And they canceled the surgery and released me from the hospital. Wow. What I prayed for happened. Except I didn't keep my end of the bargain. I, uh, I ran for another year. And I was up in Chicago singing, and I got sick again. And we had taken a bus up there with our tour group, and uh, I lost my voice. I was raging with fever. And we put me back in the bus to take me back home to my parents. I hadn't been there in a long time. And they took me and put me in my old bed, and I hadn't slept in that bed in a long time. And my mother said, your father will be home tomorrow. He's in California preaching. And when he gets home, he'll come in and lay hands on you, and God will heal you. And he had laid hands on me many times in my life, and I, I knew the power of God. And sure enough, he came home the next day, and he came into my room. And um, suddenly, it was like a wall was dissolved. Uh, and we could talk for a moment. And 
he reached out his hand to pray for me. I was laying in the bed. And he withdrew his hand before he prayed, which was unusual for him. Usually when Oral Roberts makes a move for you, he gets a hold of you and, and turn you loose till something comes out. <laughs> Feel like you put your finger in an electric light socket when he touched you. Wow, the power of God was so strong. And he, he, he withdrew his hand before he touched me. And he said, son, I had no idea. And I said, what do you mean? He said, I had no idea that you had the same call to the healing ministry that I have. And I didn't realize how God is going to use you. And he began to prophesy. Now, I'm 19 now, just two weeks before my 20th birthday. He said, I he began to prophesy. He said, I see you standing before kings and queens and presidents and prime ministers all over the world. I see you in great crusades. I see you having crowds twice as big as I had. I see you on television. I see you operating in the word of knowledge. I didn't know what the word of knowledge was. I see you with a great healing ministry, not following in my steps, but following in the footsteps of Jesus. And I was, I was in a state of shock, even though there had been those who had prophesied something along those lines over me in my childhood, but I had forgotten. And he put his hand on me and wham, the power of God hit me. And I came out of that bed. My voice was instantly healed. The fever was gone. Suddenly I could stand up again. And I got on my knees and prayed a sinner's prayer. I gave my heart to the Lord. Immediately joined his ministry. And uh, our relationship was healed. And I stood by him by his side for more than 40 years. Whatever he did, I did. Wherever he went, I went. Whatever he said, I said. I was there. I was a part of every building. I was a part of raising, every, raising up the money for almost every part of the university. I was there. The architectural renderings were on our kitchen table. I was there helping to create it. I was a part of everything. And he and I were more like brothers than father and son. And I thank God for all those years. I got my bachelor's degree from ORU. I, uh, I never wanted to go there. I had gone away to school, but after I gave my heart to the Lord, I changed my mind. And then I got my master's degree, and then I got my doctor's degree from there. And I served in a number of capacities. I served as his assistant for years, and then I served as a as an associate vice president, then I served as, a, as executive vice president, and then in 1993, I was elected the second president of the university, and I served for 15 years as president, and graduated more than 8,000 students, many from Iowa, all over this place. And uh, 10 years ago, I left, 11 years ago, I left the university to go back into full-time evangelistic ministry, which is my true calling. I'm an evangelist. I never dreamed of being a college president. I was one, but that wasn't my dream. I did it because that's what my father asked me to do. Because there was no one else who would keep it on Holy Spirit, healing, and seed faith. I was the only one. And uh, so I thank God for all that he has done in my life. At, in 2009, uh, my father said to me, your next crusade, which was to be in Kenya, in Nairobi, he said, your next crusade, you'll have twice the crowd that I had in 1968 when I was there. Well, I knew what that meant. For that to happen, I knew that he would be gone. He had had 100,000 people on the closing day in 1968, a bigger crowd than President Jomo Kenyatta had had. The nation had just received their independence from Britain, and my father was there in a crusade and had 100,000 people. Bigger, bigger crowd than the president had. He said, you have twice as many when you go. And I was going the next month. I knew what that meant. I knew that my father would be gone. And he laid his hands on me again. And uh, three weeks later, I got the call. And I went racing out as fast as I could to California where he lived at the time. He lived the last 20 years in Southern California. And I flew out as quickly as I could by his side and uh, I watched all the medical equipment that was attached to him. I watched the monitors go down, down, down and I knew it was only a matter of seconds before my father was gone from this world. And his hand was in mine 
and his eyes were fastened on me and mine were fastened on him. It was an unbelievable experience. And I watched as those numbers just kept going down and down until suddenly everything went flat. And I heard a sound. And I turned to the door. I thought the doctors and the nurses were coming in. But there was no doctor and there was no nurse. It was just me and him. And I looked up and I rubbed my eyes to see if I was seeing things. And I saw two of the largest angels I could imagine come right through the ceiling. One was tall enough that his head touched the ceiling. And the other was taller and I could only see him chest high. His head was above the ceiling. And I, I rubbed my eyes to see if I was imagining things. But I wasn't. And I watched them take their big hands and reach down into his body and pick up his spirit. And I remembered that all through my adult life I had said, Dad, I want a double portion of your spirit, which is what Elisha asked for. And I knew that God was no respecter of persons, that if Elisha could get it, I could get it. <laughs> and I watched them as they picked his spirit up and began to carry it up, and I stood up, I began to yell. I began to yell and scream. I'm surprised doctors didn't come running in. I began to yell and scream. And about that time, I saw what looked like a mantle. And it, it was released, and it came floating down in the room. And I just reached out and said, that is mine. And he was gone. The power of God came into my life, and I became like another man that day. And that was in 2009, December 15th. 2009 and the next month I was had that crusade in Kenya and the closing service we had 200,000 people largest crowd ever seen in my life tens of thousands gave their hearts to the Lord during that crusade and every word that he prophesied came to pass and uh, it's good to remember to go back and see where you came from and I thought I would share that with you this morning because a lot of you don't know me at all. You don't, and you, you may know the name of Oral Roberts, but you don't, you don't know uh, much about him. But I thought you should know that because he and I are very similar in the calling that we have. And Jesus said, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. Yeah. Amen. Amen. So I thought I should share that with you this morning, okay? So don't take that off my preaching time, all right? That's uh, <laughs> That's just my introduction. I'm just. That's just a testimony. I'm just, I'm just getting started this morning, okay? In a few minutes, I'll be fully warmed up now, okay? I, I've got to get my engine purring a little bit, you know. Hope you're, hope you're not in a hurry today, you know. Okay. Uh, lunch will wait for a while, all right? <laughs> oh, praise God. Oh, those years, those years, all those years. Uh, in, uh, in 19, let's see, it was in uh, 1968. I was not yet a Christian. I would not be a Christian for another two or three months. Uh, my father called me and said, I want you to uh, go up to New York. Now, I wasn't part of the ministry, but my dad and I, even though we were estranged, he, he had a way of, of commanding. And he'd call me and tell me something that I was going to do. He didn't ask me to do it. He said, here's what you're going to do. Yeah. The way he was. Yeah. And I'd just say, okay, <laughs> and do it. He said, I want you to go up to New York City. There's a group that's performing in Carnegie Hall. They're called Up With People. And they're part of the old uh, moral rearmament union group. And they're performing. They're all good-looking kids. And uh, I want you to go see them because I'm going back on primetime television. He's been off TV for a couple of years going back on primetime in color. Now, that was most of the programs in those days were shot in black and white in the late 60s, but now we're going on in color. And we're going to do primetime television specials. Some of you will remember some of those. And he said, uh, he said, you're going to be the main singer. And I wasn't even a Christian. You're going to be the main singer, and I want you to, to go and, and see these, these kids sing, and I want you to build a group for me because in a couple of months we're going to go back on, on uh, national television. And so I did. I went to New York. I saw the group. I built a group. And then, of course, two months later, I gave my heart to the Lord, and I fully embraced it. And we went back on primetime uh, television. And uh, uh, 
we set this country on fire because of what we did. Uh, it was unheard of that a preacher would go on national television in prime time. No one did that but him. And uh, because I was, uh, I was his son and because I was the singer, um, I got to sing with all the people who were guests on the program. I wasn't asked to sing with them. I was told, you're going to sing with them. <laughs> And um, um, it, it was amazing. We were doing our programs at the old NBC studios in Burbank, California, just north of Hollywood. And he would bring a secular guest star on in order to try to attract an audience. So in the second half of the program, he could preach. And so uh, we brought, had all these guest stars come on, and I would I'd get to sing with all of them, you know. And I got to sing with the with the who's who of Hollywood in those years. I, I got to sing with Aretha Franklin. I, I got to sing with Gladys Knight. I got to sing with Roy Rogers and Dale Evans. I got to sing with Johnny Cash. You know? uh, I got to sing with uh, so many of those people uh, over the years. Uh, Roy Clark, uh, Mel Tillis, uh, Lynn Anderson, uh, all the great country singers. I, I got to sing with, with all of them. And uh, I just I was told, you're going to be singing with them. Okay, oh, so we sing together. Sing with B.J. Thomas, uh, sing with Robert Goulet, uh, all these people I, 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 I sang with. And during those years, especially in the middle 70s, our programs became so popular across America that uh, he was asked to go on all of the, uh, of the major uh, television talk shows. And uh, the, 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 large, the biggest shows of the day, uh, Merv Griffin, uh, Johnny Carson, uh, Dick Cavett, uh, David Frost, uh, Mike Douglas, all those shows, uh, Joey Bishop, all their shows, he was asked, and he would say, well, I'll come, but my son's going to sing. So I was never invited once, but I went on all the shows. <laughs> I sang on all of them. And uh, he, they'd have the Hollywood types, you know, on there, and then they'd have him. And usually they'd set him up. They'd find someone who's an atheist or an agnostic, and then they would introduce him and uh, to try to get some kind of controversy going. And he'd always, he'd always have me sing. So, well, if you want me, you're going to take my son. So uh, I, I got to sing on all those shows. And we were doing Merv Griffin when you're, uh, and they used to tape their shows at the old Metro Media Studios in Hollywood. And we were there doing the show, and it was over. Um, we went out, out to, to the car and went out through the stage door, and there were a bunch of people with their autograph books uh, waiting uh, for all of us to sign. And uh, Merv, Merv Griffin was signing. My dad was signing. Uh, the other guests were on the show were signing. And one lady put her autograph book right in front of me. said, are you anybody? <laughs> <laughs> It gives you that warm feeling, you know. I said, well, ma'am, I guess not. <laughs> she said, well, sign just in case you ever become somebody. <laughs> so I signed her book. Oh, my. My, 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 my. The people that I got to sing with, Burl Ives, um, so many great, those great Hollywood stars. And many of them really loved the Lord. Come on now. Some of them, you know, what the... Uh, uh, but, but they, my dad uh, got an audience for that so he could, he could preach and minister to the people. But I thank God for all that. I thank God for all of these wonderful, wonderful years and all the things that I've experienced, all the people that I've met, presidents of the United States uh, that I've met, that I've laid hands on, and 34 leaders of world nations around the world, all, all these things that, that God has brought into my life. And uh, I thank God for the healing ministry because that's my true calling. So that's my testimony this morning. I thought I'd just share that with you. If you have your Bible, I'm through my introduction now. Uh, if you've got your Bible this morning, um, open it to Daniel 3. Uh, as, my, as my father preached in his crusades, he had a number of sermons that he called sugar sticks. They were sermons that people demanded that he preach at least once in a crusade. There were sermons that he preached, sermons like uh, Samson and Delilah, the Battle of Champions, uh, Transferred Power, and one particularly, probably the most sought-after message that he ever preached was, was on the subject of the fourth man. And uh, you can still see some of those uh, online from time to time. And my father always loved the fact that I would take his messages and run them through my own hopper, you know, and preach them. He said, I'm so glad that you're not ashamed to preach a message, you know, that, that, that a revelation that God had given me. And so, so from time to time, I'll pull out one of, 
those great, great messages and, and, uh, and touch people's lives because the message is just as strong today as it was then. And I thought, seeing as how I'm here now for the first time, uh, and I have seven more services after this to focus in, I thought I might just do something a little special for you this morning and, and uh, touch you in a way that perhaps you've not been touched. So open your Bible this morning to Daniel chapter 3. And let me just share something with you today that I pray will be a blessing. Daniel chapter 3, beginning at verse 15, and I hope I can read this without my glasses. Uh, now, if you be ready... And at what time you hear the sound of the coronet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, and dulcimer, and all kinds of music, you fall down and worship the image which I have made. If you worship, but if you worship it not, then in the same hour I shall cast you into a burning, fiery furnace. And who is the God? that shall deliver you out of my hands. I want you to picture the beautiful city of Jerusalem built on the hill, Mount Zion. I want you to see it. Just close your eyes for a moment and visualize this magnificent city funded by David, built by King Solomon, his son. I want you to visualize the magnificent walls and the gates especially the eastern gate. I want you to see what we look at now as part of the Wailing Wall. See this magnificent structure and see the temple which Solomon built and all of the great biblical artifacts that were a part of it, all the symbols of worship. I want you to see the people as they come bringing their offerings, lambs, birds, as they sacrificed unto the Lord. In those days, God received blood offerings. That was changed when Jesus went to the cross. But he required a sacrifice of blood, bulls and goats and birds. See the people as they worship God. See them as they danced in the streets before the Lord. See them as they lifted their hands and gave honor and glory. But as the years passed, things began to change. And their worship waxed cold and became a ritual to them. There was no power in it. There was no worship in it. They were just going through the motions, which is what has happened in the lives of many Christians today. Just the same old six and seven. It's this seeker-friendly thing that we're seeing where there's no power. Three points and a poem and a handshake and you go home. And there's no life. That's what happened in the nation of Israel. See them as they turned away from God and they turned to gods of brass and iron and wood and stone. And they allowed false prophets to rise up among them. And God became displeased. Now travel with me some 500 miles eastward to the great city of Babylon. See that magnificent structure built by Nebuchadnezzar, the king. See the beautiful hanging gardens which he built as a monument to his vain wife, one of the eight wonders of the old world. See the magnificent walls which were thick enough for six chariots to race side by side on the top. An impregnable city. And picture Nebuchadnezzar as he stands out on his balcony looking over all the kingdoms that he had subdued, realizing that there was one kingdom he had not yet controlled, the little kingdom of Israel. And he called on his crack legions and marched across the desert and laid siege to the city. He tore down the walls broke into the temple, stole all the great artifacts and historical pieces, and kidnapped hundreds of young men and women, the pride of Israel, young men like Daniel, 
Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. See them as they're forced marched across the desert. And as they come into Babylon, the people line the streets shouting at them, Sing us the songs of your God. But they replied, How can we sing the songs of our God in a distant foreign land? And the Bible says they hung their harps upon the willows and they wept. Picture them as they are literally assimilated into the Babylonian Empire. They were taught the language. They began to dress like the Babylonians dressed, which was required. Many were put into the service of the king. Many were made eunuchs, including Daniel, most scholars believe. See them as they rose in prominence. For Nebuchadnezzar loved Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He found no other young men like them. And he brought them up quickly in his service. Then one day, Nebuchadnezzar decided there was nothing else for him to conquer. So he would build a monument to himself. And out of the plains of Dura, he built a huge golden statue. And he put out the word, when you hear the music of the clarinets, and when you hear the music of the flutes, and when you hear the music of the horns, you've got to bow down and worship the idol. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego took one look and said, we know we can't do this. For the scripture says, you shall have no graven image before you. They knew they had a problem. Good news travels fast, but bad news travels faster. It didn't take long for Nebuchadnezzar to find that there were three young men in his kingdom who refused to bow. And he knew that if he didn't do something about it quickly, it could be the beginning of the end of his rule. For if they could get away with it, others soon could get away with it. And his kingdom could be wrecked. But he loved them. He loved them. Let me say it again. He loved them. And he gave them a second chance. And that's something that Satan will do to you and me. He will always give us a second chance. He'll always come at us from a different angle. Giving us a second chance to serve him. And Nebuchadnezzar gave them a second chance and called them and said to them very kindly, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? I've heard that everyone else is bowing to my golden image, but you will not bow to my golden image. Is it true? Is it true? Yes, Your Majesty. Well, I'm going to give you a second chance. I'm going to give you one more opportunity. And this time, when you hear the music, if you fall down and worship the idol, then it'll go well with you. His face must have changed. He said, if you do not bow, however, then that hour I will cast you alive into a burning, fiery furnace. And who is the God who will deliver you out of my hands? That moment in your life when you have to choose between heaven and hell. That moment, whether it's God or the devil, take this, try that. This won't harm you. That moment you have to make that decision. Well, if they're not going to heaven with me, I'm not going to hell with them. The decisions in life. The burning, fiery furnaces that we as human beings face every day all the tricks and strategies of the devil that come against us to try to keep us and hold us down. Things that we sometimes even blame God for, which are not God's fault. And he's taking the blame unjustly. This time, if you bow, it'll go well for you. But if you don't, I will cast you alive into a burning, fiery furnace. And who is the God who will deliver you in, out of my hands? They said, Your Majesty, we don't even have to pray about this. We will not bow. You may throw us in, but we have a God who is able. We have a God who is able to deliver us. Let the heathen rage. We have a God who is able. We have a God who is able. 
We have a God who will deliver us out of the hands of the enemy. It may not look like it. It may not feel like it presently, but I've got news. He's the deliverer. And he will set you free in every area of your life if you'll trust in him. Even when the fire gets hot. If ever there was a time that the fire is hot, it is now. Because there's hell out there waiting for us on every corner. Every type of compromise. But my experience with compromise is what you usually compromise to gain, you lose in the end. It's much better just to stand up strong for the Lord. You say, well, what if I get hit? Well, welcome to the world. I've been hit in my life. I know what it's like to be hit. I know what it's like to have people come up while I'm preaching and spit in my face. I've had it happen. I know what it's like for people to ball up their fist and strike me. I've had it happen while I'm preaching. I know what it's like to be accused of things that I didn't do. I know what it's like to have things written about me that, that aren't true. I know what it's like for the Lord to say, you cannot defend yourself. Leave that to me. But what about people who believe that mess? Lord, he said, would say, I mean, leave that to me. Leave that to me. I've been accused of so many things in my life that I haven't done, but I've never defended myself because I've followed the example of Jesus. And when they questioned him before the Sanhedrin, the Bible says he didn't say a word. It's hard to keep your mouth shut. Because there are times in life when you feel like something ought to be said. And you can correct a lot by just saying what you know. And the Lord says, keep your mouth shut and I'll honor you. That's hard. That's difficult. When the fire is raging, when all it seems like the media is coming at you and, and all things that are being said and done that you know aren't true. And you just hold on. You just hold on. You just hold on and keep your head up and hold your shoulders straight. Hard. Oh, life's fiery furnaces. They said, Your Majesty, we don't have to pray about it. You may throw us in, but God will deliver us out of your hands. Amen. Nebuchadnezzar turned into rage and he called on the mighty men, the Bible says, and bound them and cast them in alive. The mighty men got too near the flames and they were consumed. They must not have been made out of the right kind of stuff. <laughs> Nebuchadnezzar must have turned to walk away saying, there, that will take care of that. But as he walked on, curiosity must have got the best of him. As he turned around to look at their burning bodies. Yeah. His eyes must have come out on stems. Yeah. Did we not cast in three? Yeah. And were they not bound? Yeah. Oh, yes, Your Majesty. Yeah. I see four. Yeah. And they're loosed. Yeah. And the fourth man yeah. looks like the Son of God. Who is this fourth man? In Genesis, he is the seed of the woman. In Exodus, he is the Passover lamb. In Leviticus, he's our high priest. In Numbers, he's the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. In Deuteronomy, he is the prophet like unto Moses. In Joshua, he is the captain of our salvation. In Judges, he's our judge and lawgiver. In Ruth, he's our kinsman redeemer. In First and Second Samuel, he's our trusted prophet. In Kings and Chronicles, he's our reigning king. In Ezra, he is the faithful scribe. In Nehemiah, the rebuilder of the broken down walls of human lives. In Esther, he is our Mordecai. And in Job, he's our day spring on high and our ever living redeemer. Who is this fourth man? In Psalms, he's the Lord, our shepherd. In Proverbs and Ecclesiastes, he's our wisdom. In the Song of Solomon, he's our lover and the bridegroom. In Isaiah, he's the prince of peace. In Jeremiah, the righteous branch. In Lamentations, he's our weeping prophet. In Ezekiel, he's the wheel in the middle of the wheel. And in Daniel, he's the fourth man in the burning, fiery 
furnace. Who is this fourth man? In Hosea, he's the faithful husband forever married to the backslider. In Joel, he's the baptizer with the Holy Ghost and with fire. In Amos, he's our burden bearer. In Obadiah, he is the mighty to save. In Jonah, he is our great foreign missionary. In Micah, he is the messenger with beautiful feet carrying the gospel. In Nahum, he is the avenger of God's elect. In Habakkuk, he is God's evangelist crying, Revive thy work in the midst of the years. In Zephaniah, he is the savior. In Haggai, he's the owner of all the silver and all the gold, all the precious stones that are in the earth. In Zechariah, he is the fountain opened up in the house of David for sin and uncleanness. And in Malachi, he's the son of righteousness rising with healing in his wings. Who is this fourth man? In Matthew, he's the Messiah. In Mark, the wonder worker. In Luke, he's the son of man. In John, he's the son of God. In Acts, he's the blessed Holy Spirit. In Romans, he's our justifier. Yeah. In First and Second Corinthians, he's the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. In Galatians, he's our redeemer from the curse of the law. Yeah. In Ephesians, he's our seven-piece armor. Yeah. In Philippians, he's the God who supplies all your need according to his riches in glory. Who is this fourth man? In Colossians, he's the third person of the Holy Trinity. In 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, he's the Lord coming in the clouds with a trumpet and a shout saying, Come up here. In 1st and 2nd Timothy, he's our mediator between God and man. In Titus, he's our faithful pastor. In Philemon, he's a friend who sticks closer than a brother. Who is this fourth man? In Hebrews, he's the blood of the everlasting covenant. In James, he is our great physician. In First and Second Peter, he's the stripes on his back for your healing. In First, Second, and Third John, he is everlasting love. In Jude, he is the Lord coming with ten thousands of his saints. And get ready for this in the book of Revelations. He's the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Who is he? Who is this fourth man? Who is he? Let me tell you who he is. He is Abel's sacrifice. He is Noah's rainbow. He is Abraham's ram caught in the thicket. He's Jacob's ladder. He's Issachar's burdens. He's Isaac's wells. He's a Joseph's coat of many colors. That's who he is. He is Samuel's horn of oil. He is a Samson's jawbone of a donkey. He's the righteous judgments of Deborah. Who is he? He's David's slingshot. He's the ravens that flew for Elijah. He's Elisha's bald head. He is Hezekiah's sundial. Who is he? He's Mary's angelic visitation. He's the baby leaping in Elizabeth's body. He's Peter's shadow. He's Paul's handkerchiefs and aprons laid upon the sick for healing. He's Luke's medical equipment. Who is he? I'll tell you who he is. He's a husband to the widow. He's a father to the orphan. He's the bright and morning star, the lily of the valley, the fairest of 10,000 to our souls. He's our rock, our sword, and our shield. He is most high the possessor of heaven and earth and the one who delivers us from all of our enemies. Who is he? Let me tell you who he is. He is Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the son of the living God. And if you trust him, if you trust him, like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego trusted him, and seeing as how he is no respecter of persons, if he will bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego out, he'll bring you out. Yeah. 
Nebuchadnezzar said, bring them forth. And out of the fire they came. No smell of smoke on their body. Not even a hair on their head was singed. Nebuchadnezzar must have swallowed hard. And said, there is no God who can deliver like the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And if anyone says anything against their God, they'll be cut to pieces and their home will be destroyed. For there is no God. Did you hear what I said? There's no God. There's no God. No God in this world. came to a point in my life when I recognized that nothing that I had planned would save me. No dream, no vision that I had. I had to have God. I had to accept who I was and who I was called to be and what I was called to do. And when I came to that point in my life, I said, it doesn't matter to me what the world says doesn't matter what somebody thinks. doesn't matter what somebody does. What matters is that I am obedient. Like the Apostle Paul who said, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision. That's my life. And that's your life. And if you don't stand for something, you'll fall for just about anything. Every, every head bowed, please. Father, do not let a man or a woman or a young person who's heard me preach this morning and share my testimony lose their soul and go to hell. That is my prayer. Please remain with your heads bowed. There are some of you here today who don't know Christ as your Savior. You've never repented never received Christ as your Lord you've never said God be merciful to me a sinner but you want to and there are others here today you've slipped away from God you once had a relationship with him but it's grown cold and you know it but you said if I can just get to church today someone will lead me to the throne of God's grace I have news for you. I am that someone. I know exactly what to do. But for it to work, you've got to cooperate. I'm asking every man, every woman who's tired of sin, you're tired of the lifestyle, you're tired of the game, and you'd like to make an honest commitment of your life to Christ, and you'd like me to pray for you. Or if you've been running from God, you want to come back to him today and you want to receive him as your savior and you'd like me to pray a salvation rededication prayer if you do and if you'd like me to pray that sinner's prayer that prayer of rededication over you if you would then I want you to take the first step right now hold your hand up I want to pray for you hold it up high don't be ashamed Jesus said if you'll confess me in front of men I will confess you in front of my Father. But if you don't confess me in front of men, then neither will I confess you in front of my Father. Hold your hand up high. Now you with your hands raised, step out in the aisle, come to this altar right now, this moment. Come on. If you lifted your hand, step out in the aisle, come down here right now. Let me pray for you. Don't wait another second. Don't miss your hour of visitation. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. Is there someone else to say, Richard, wait for me. I need, I need this prayer. Wait for me. Wait for me. If that's you, come on down here right now. Come on. Don't miss it. You have no promise of tomorrow. You may hit a telephone pole on your way home. You don't know. Today is the day to get your heart right with God. 
He said, someone else said, Richard, wait for me. I need this prayer. If that's you, come down here right now. All right, congregation, stretch your hands out toward them. And you here in the front who've come for prayer, lift your hands like I'm doing. And I want you to pray this prayer out loud after me. Oh God, oh God. be merciful, be merciful. to me. A sinner, a backslider. I have missed the mark with my life, and I repent. I'm sorry. I changed my mind. I turned my back on the past. I renounced the devil and all of his works. And with my mouth, I confess that Jesus is Lord. And today, I receive him as my Lord and Savior. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus. Save me. Heal me. Deliver me. And set me free. From this hour, I will serve God with all my heart, all my mind, and all my strength. I declare I'm a Christian. My sins are forgiven and washed away. God no longer remembers them. I am free to serve God and I will serve God every day of my life. In Jesus name. Amen. Somebody just rejoice with them. says when a sinner comes home there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels well if they're rejoicing don't you think we ought to be rejoicing have materials in the aisles for you make your way back to your seat get that packet of material give them a God bless you as they go if you're not already a member of this church, you're in a fine place. Now catch hands with the person next to you. Tonight, we're going to begin the, the healing ministry. That doesn't mean it can't start right now. Tonight, we're going to have a healing service. The whole service is going to be dedicated to the healing ministry tonight. First, I'll be ministering on the, the healing, and then later in the week on the Holy Spirit, and later in the week on seed faith, and on gifts of the Spirit, and on armor of God, and who knows, we may have a breakout of the joy of the Lord. You never know. It may happen. I'm just an instrument. I do what I'm told. <laughs> I had a good teacher from my dad. <laughs> he, he taught me to obey, so I learned how to obey God. But I'd be remiss if I didn't have a healing prayer over you this morning. So just join hands with somebody. Father, it's not by might, and it's certainly not by power, but it's by the Holy Spirit that I pray this prayer today. You foul sickness. You foul torment that's come against my brother, my sister physically. I bind you, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. Every sickness, every disease, every fear, every doubt, anything and everything that is unlike God, I command it in the name of Jesus. Come out! Turn loose! Let go! In the name of Jesus. And I send the healing word of God to you today. For healing in your mind. Healing in your body. Healing in your family. Healing in your finances. Healing in your emotions. Healing on your job, in your business, in your ministry, in your marriage, in your relationships. Healing in every area of your life. From the crown of your head even unto the soles of your feet. 
Satan, I command you by the name of Jesus, you take your filthy, dirty, rotten, stinking hands off of God's property. For my friends, you do not belong to the devil, you belong to God. You were paid for by the shed blood of his only son. And Lord, we make a commitment to you, we will show forth Jesus in our lives. And I thank you, Father. I thank you for this church, for this ministry, for Pastor Jay and Debbie, for all the staff here. Most of all, I thank you for the presence and the power of God that I feel here. And I thank you, Father, for this opportunity to be here. And I thank you that you'll confirm this word. And as people go forth from this service today, they'll feel healing, refreshed and renewed with a new commitment unto the Lord, knowing that no matter what the devil may throw at you, you have a God who's able to deliver you. And Father, I thank you and I give you praise. Just lift your voice in the spirit. Yes, thank you for healing the fingers. Thank you for healing the shoulders. Thank you, Lord, for healing the hips. Thank you for healing the heart. Thank you for healing the blood pressure and the blood sugar. Thank you, Father. Thank you for healing the stiffness and the swelling in the ankles and the knees. Thank you for the pain leaving hips now. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father, for ears to hear, eyes to see. Thank you, Father, for healing. And thank you, Lord, for these days here at this wonderful church. And thank you for an opportunity to open my heart tonight and to really teach on healing and give a demonstration tonight, Father. Show yourself strong tonight. And let these who are here today bring those who need the healing touch of God. That this church, that this city will never be the same again. Our lives will never be the same again. And Father, we praise you. And we give you honor. And we give you glory in it. For yours is the power and the glory. The honor in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Now just lift your hands and give him praise. Give him honor. Give him glory. Did you not know that I would be in your presence today? Did you not know that wherever you stand, wherever you sit, I'm there? Did you not know that I'm filling you with my love, with my spirit, with my touch? Thank you, Father. I appreciate that word. Thank you, Father. Praise you. I worship you this morning. I give you honor and give you glory. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Hallelujah. 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 Somebody's getting healed right now. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Lives are being changed today. Sickness and disease packing their bags and leaving town. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father, for change, positive, strong, effective change in our lives. Praise you, Lord. Praise you. Praise you. Thank you for that hip spur being healed right now. That hip pointer, the hip spur being healed right now in the name of Jesus. Thank you for that person who's able to lift their right shoulder all the way up now. All the pain's leaving. All the pain's going now in Jesus' name. Shoulder being healed right now. Shoulder being healed right now, right now. You'll be able to lift it all the way up. Pain's gone. Pain's gone, pain's gone, pain's gone. Thank you for the, the left side of the nasal passages opening up. Thank you, Father. The, yeah, the incessant coughing stops too. Thank you, Father. I praise you. I bless you, Father. I give you praise and honor. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. 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 Yes, 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 yes. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Maybe some of you will see what I'm seeing. I don't know. I haven't seen this for a while, but I'm seeing it this morning. Just as we were praying in tongues a moment ago, I saw a legion of angels come right through that wall. And they had baskets on their arms. And they were dropping healings on people's heads. I haven't seen that in a while. 
I've seen it several times, but I haven't seen it in a while. I saw baskets on their arms, and they had healings, and they were dropping it on people's heads, and they were over our heads. I know that's, I know that's not in the natural, that's in the supernatural, but I see it in the spirit. It came right through that wall flying right over our heads with baskets on their arms and dropping healings, dropping healings, dropping miracles. Lord, let this be a week of miracles. A week of miracles like Cedar Rapids has not seen in a long time. And Lord, use me. Spill me out, Lord. Let me Give everything that is in me this week. Lord, let me leave nothing on the table. Let me give all I have to be a blessing. Every one of you knows someone who needs healing. Get them here. Get them here. I can't pray for them if they're not here. Bring them in. Tonight, I'm going to teach you how you can have your own healing ministry to show you, to demonstrate how you can do what I do. I'm going to show you the secret of how to do it. You don't want to miss tonight. I don't know what time it is, but 7, well, be here at 6.59. <laughs> don't miss a moment. Uh, can I have those uh, books, Pastor Jimmy? Uh, I brought some resources. Thank you. I brought some